sir. Who was uh, the main character, if you can say it that way, of chapter 19 last week? Who was the main person we talked about? Lot. Lot. And was 19 a good chapter for Lot or a bad chapter for Lot? Bad. And it wasn't the best, right? He, he struggled. Um, chapter 20, we're going to shift our focus. We're going to go back to um, Abraham now, uh, for the most part, and, and him and his wife, Sarah. Like I said, I always want to go back and mention, at least with Lot, even though chapter 19 was bad, even though he made a lot of bad decisions, and I've talked about this several times, how did the New Testament refer to Lot anyway? Right. Righteous Lot. So he made mistakes, there's no doubt. But still, um, the New Testament you know, referred to him as righteous. And so, again, to me, that provides hope for ourselves that the standard isn't, you know, the standard is perfection, but we ourselves do not have to be perfect because that's impossible to be pleasing to God. So don't ever get down on yourself. Don't ever give up hope in your Christian walk. You can think, man, I've just done too many things. I'm too far gone. That's never the case. So that gives me an abundance of hope. So I want to read the first three ch verses of chapter 20. <clears throat> and Abraham journeyed from there to the south, and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and in Pity and Gerar, and Gerar. Now Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister, and Abimelech, king to Gerar, sent and, and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. So how do we start off chapter 20? Abraham does something that he's done in the past. He starts off by lying again. Abraham, well, he starts off with a partial lie. He's going to justify himself because how is it a partial lie? It's his mother's daughter, not his father's daughter. It's half-sister, right? But still, what is the intent of him saying that she is his, his sister. It's, it's supposed to be deceptive. It's, it's a lie. So again, Abraham, friend of God, but still the Bible, again, it goes to me, this goes to the truest inspiration of the Bible. It shows the flaws of its heroes. So Abraham starts off with a lie. What, what, is, um, what is surprising about the fact that Abraham has to keep doing this? Or at least he feels a need to keep doing this. I think that's a really bad way to ask that. How old is Sarah right here? 90. 90. So, again, as we get older, we become less and less concerned, it seems like, with the outward appearance. But Abraham still has this concern with Sarah at 90. Why do you think that might be? This is just completely, you know, subjection. This is just guesses. Why do you think that might be the case? Possibly, yeah. Possibly, maybe that maybe they're, they're aging a little slower. Perhaps I'm thinking this is this is all just perhaps. So just you know thinking. What is Sarah getting ready to do next next chapter? Have a child. She's getting ready to have a child. So again, that's miraculous. It was it was past the time for a woman in her own, her own words. But again, the Bible does give some indication, and I think in fact uh, it talks about. Um, I believe it's Moses, right? Oh, uh, see, I should study ahead on things like this off the top of my head. How old was Moses when he, he led the people uh, out of Egypt? 80. He was 80, because he was 40 when he was first called, and he left for 40. He came back at 80, and he led them through the wilderness for how long? 40 years. 40 years, so he's 120. Does anybody recall what it said about Moses when he was 120? He said like his strength hadn't abated. He was like still in his, I want to say his prime, but he was still a very able-bodied a man to lead a people, to lead an army, to lead this group. So again, we're talking just perhaps, perhaps, since Sarah is getting ready to have a child at 97 years old, perhaps, you know, she aged a little different, perhaps. But anyway, regardless, yes, sir? <laughs> apparently so, I mean, apparently so, because not only is, not only has, that's exactly right, not only is Abraham concerned about it, he's rightly concerned about it, because the people like Caesar says, yeah, I want her. Bring her into my, you know, harem or whatever they called it back then. So again, it, it, it's it's just to me it's unique because you, when you, if you read through it, you wouldn't think about it. You just read through it thinking, oh, she's still a relatively young woman. 
But then when you go through and you add up all the ages, no, she's, she's 90. So again, just an interesting fact. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read. Oh, go ahead. Or, so the other time he lied, there were 65. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when he lies that time, uh, to save his skin, but also to try and help protect his wife and whatnot. And since then, he's received the seed promise, and that promise has been reiterated uh, three times to this point. And so maybe Abraham's lying because. He fails to recognize that the seed promise includes his seed. And it's not just Sarah's seed. And so maybe he's worried that uh, if he says to his wife, he'll die, and then she'll have a child with a bit of life or someone. Perhaps, yeah. Like Potential rationale. Yeah, it's perhaps. And again, it, it, no doubt it's, it's, a, it's a reoccurring concern because I don't think we're going to get to that right ahead. It's either here and later in 20 or verse 21, because he, he's done it before, he's done it again, and then it actually goes into the discussion of whenever they started to, their, this journey of, uh, of being without their hometown, he made her promise. He goes, do me this kindness. He goes, anywhere we go, tell them you're my sister. So the fear that Abraham has, again, goes back to the fact that he's not growing up in his hometown, that he is a sojourner. That he's going to a new place often. And every time you go into a new place, there are some new hurdles. You know, people who know you from way back, you get to kind of explain yourself or your history or anything. Not as much because they know you. But every time you go to a new place, there's this reoccurring fear. And it's this weakness with Abraham shows itself again and again. He, he, um, he's concerned with it. Again, shows, shows his weakness in, in some aspects. Again, the fact that he's not perfect. I don't. I, I don't. I just know God had told him to go out and, and, and to, to go forth, and he was showing a place. So, again, every time Abraham moved and knowing the kind of man Abraham was, I would assume, again, in a complete assumption, could be wrong, probably am, that God is telling him it's time to go on. It's time to move on. We're, this, is, this is not the place yet, right? Because he, he, you know, he's going to eventually get to a point where what's, Ab what's God going to tell Abraham at the end of his wandering around? about what his people are going to inherit. Do you remember that? He tells him, everywhere you've been, is that not right about that? Yep. Everywhere you've been, everywhere your foot is touched, this is, we're going to, this is going to be your country. So again, maybe he's unknowingly mapping out um, what he's going to inherit, I guess. Anything else? I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. Other than to read, read what he read. Somebody else. But Abimelech did not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. All right, to me, again, this is fascinating stuff to me anyway. Um, God shows up in a dream to Abimelech, and what does God say to him? He goes, you're a dead man. <laughs> he goes, not, not a whole lot of mincing of words. You're a dead man. How does Abimelech interpret that in regards not only to himself, but to his country? Was it going to be like a, a, an exact punishment on this him? No, on his people. No, on his people. Yes. And so he begins to, um, I have flashbacks to Abraham talking with um, the Lord when he appeared to him in the form of man, saying, hey, there's you know, 45, 40. Like a, what, what, is, what is Abimelech's justification for what he had done? Right. What else? He you're, said you're going to destroy a whole righteous people. He's, he's, he's also he's, he's going at it. He's trying to defend his actions mm -hmm. towards God and the things that he did. Say, did I not act off of bad information? 
information or good information yeah. since what I was told. So, I mean, what was Abimelech? I mean, and it, some people, you know, they'll seek to justify themselves falsely in, in any case, but is Abimelech justified in his justification here? I believe so. He didn't know. I mean, that's what he's saying. He goes, I didn't know. He goes, Abraham told me this. She told me this. They, you know, conspired together, kind of like somebody else in the New Testament, Ananias, in a lie. And he goes, so I did not know. Well, God said also that he knew that, but he kept him from sinning. That's exactly right. God, God even backs him up and says, I know you didn't know. And he goes, but I also providentially kept you from touching her so you wouldn't actually, you know, go through with the sin. Right? Since he had taken her for one of his wives. I assume one of his wives, not just a soul wife. Um, but again, there's there's several things we learn. Abimelech, if he had sinned and gone through the sin, it would be a punishment not only to him, but to his people. God was going to take vengeance for uh, that sinful act. What else does it tell us about sin as far as the requirement to know or not know it is a sin that you're doing? Even if you don't know, you're going to be killed the other day. He, God calls it a sin. So whether Abimelech knew it or not, it is still a sin. You think about, okay, flash forward, trying to draw applications to our lives. Modern day, you know, here and now, New Testament. Talk about the, the thorny issue of divorce and remarriage. What do people sometimes argue about to justify a bad marriage? They didn't know the details of divorce. They didn't know. What else do they say? They go, well, that happened before I became a Christian. And after I'm a Christian, I, you know, baptism takes it away. No, it does not. It was sin before you were a Christian. It is sin after you're a Christian. And the only way you take care of sin is to repent of sin. And the only way you truly repent is to stop doing it. So what is, I mean, what has it been like? Could he have said, oh, I didn't know, but I'm still going to keep her? No. He has to give her back to Abraham. It, it wasn't his, it, she wasn't his wife to take. So there's all kinds of lessons and stuff. Does that make sense? Lessons we can draw from that? Clear as mud? Yeah. Anything else in those few verses right there? Okay. I'm trying to think. Let's just read... Um, Read through verse 12. Yes, sir. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee? And thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they that slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. Okay, several things in here. Um, also, I want to back up before, well, sorry, I should have pointed out. The idea of um, Abimelech not knowing the situation he was getting himself into and the fact that it was in sin. Can someone turn over to, to Luke 12, verses 48, um, 47 and 48? Luke 12, verses 47 and 48, and read that when you get there, please. For that servant which knew his Lord, his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of Christ shall be bitten, beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required, and to 
Jim soon did have committed much of him. They were at the point. Okay. Again, I just want to just bring out that this this thought right here. You hear it said a lot of time, all sins are equal, or sin is a sin. And in a sense, that is true. Any non-repentant of sin, no matter how great or how small, will keep you out of heaven. Um, but the Bible does indicate that there is um, that there is degrees of sin, um, that there are worse sins and there are lesser sins. In specific to this this example of Abimelech. And what we just read here in Luke, what makes the sin lesser in a sense? The not the knowledge, right? There, Abimelech would have sinned because he didn't know, but it was still called sin. New Testament flash forward. There's things people are going to do that you don't know, and if you still, it's not a justification for doing them. But God says they will be punished with fewer stripes. Whereas if you know something is is um, is wrong and you continue to do it. There's a greater punishment for that, and again, that's it's not a it's it's it's, it's a point, but I mean it, it's just something that sometimes sometimes people have a hard time grasping, and and sometimes people use it for justification like oh this is not that big a sin it's something they want to do so to me it's not that big a sin I'm like continue to do it, I'm not saying that at all that's not acceptable, but it ha it goes back to ignorance and you see that if you've been a parent you do that with your own kids, if your kids are doing something wrong. But it's not something you've talked about with them before. You handle that a certain way, right? But if it's something that you address time and time again with your child and they continue to do it, does the punishment start to ramp up? Do you start to get a little bit more severe because that's wanton disobedience? Yeah. And so again, we can see that not only in ourselves, but we can see that we can understand that from God's perspective, I would, I would imagine. Right. And uh, you don't want to be on either side of it because nope. punishment is there for punishment. It's a punishment, right? Punishment from God, and, right? And it's eternal, you know. And uh, so yes, the distinction is there. Uh, we also see that Second Thessalonians. We read it pretty often about when Christ comes back in flaming fire and taking vengeance on those that know not God. Mm -hmm. That's kind of that same thought of they don't have that knowledge of what they should or shouldn't be doing. But yet they're lumped into the, the group that's going to suffer punishment. Right. So, you don't want few or many stripes. You don't want any stripes. You don't want any stripes. <laughs> and you sure don't want to be, you know, pushing back on God and just direct the fire. So, right. Yeah. That's what I think the Bible talks about. Again, the, 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 the punishment for those who have known the way of truth and then turn away from it. I mean, I can't comprehend God's punishment anyway, but I surely can't get my brain around what those people are going to experience. Those people who, who've crucified, you know, the Son of God afresh, that's going to be uh, an our vernacular tough road to hoe, right? Right. Some of it, what I, I you know, believe is going to be self-imposed because if you knew that you had eternal life in your hand and all you had to do was hang on for a while and obey, and yet you have an eternity to think about that, and that's all that's there, it never goes away. Yeah, that's, a, that's definitely going to be a component that of it. That in and of itself. Be rough. That's right. Yep. No doubt. I have a little bit of a, a thought <clears throat> about um, what God does for Abimelech. Uh, Abimelech, um, evidently, he's an innocent person. God identifies him as someone of a pure heart. He's led an innocent people. Typically, innocent people are led by innocent leaders, at least in the history of Israel. Um, but he's beguiled. And he's going to suffer death because of that beguilement. But God doesn't just turn a blind eye to it and allow it to happen, right? God could have if he chose, but he set out uh, some sorts of invitation for Abimelech to be made right. Um, I don't know, but for me, it kind of plays into necessity and pattern for evangelism uh, because if you look at what Doyle was talking about those who do not know uh, there's people out here who do not know God they haven't heard about the church they don't know about the church they've been beguiled into believing that something else is the church and so they could in a sense die unknowing and not understand they can search the scriptures and they can study their, their way out of that 
I would say a good portion of the church today is founded on that principle of setting yourself out of the denomination. Um, but, I mean, you just think about that, that the fact that people could suffer. It's a godly thing to do on our part. And it's godly because that's what God did, is to seek them out and explain to them the way he's right. Right. Right, and we're also going to see, and this is kind of jumping ahead, and we're going to jump ahead because it kind of ties in with what you're saying, in the latter part of what Joel read, 11 and 12, what is the reason that Abraham gave? Because Abimelech's offended by this, right? He goes, you would not only, it's like, did I wrong you that you would do this to me? That you would withhold this from me, this information? And, he, and what is Abraham's response to that? He assumed it was godless. He assumed, the assumption was, this is a godless place, and even if I told you, you know, that if I would have told you she's my wife, you would have killed me to take her. That's the assumption. So, tying in with evangelism, so often um, we look on the surface and go, ooh, I don't want to knock on that door. Ooh, I don't want to bring this up with this person, just on appearance. And how often can we say, you know, have we been shown that our, our superficial judgment is wrong. Can, can, can we see the heart? No, we cannot. No, we cannot. And I, I, I will trace that cover to cover. Cover to cover. Yes, ma'am? If this is Abraham's true reason for selling them out, for them to be afraid that he would be killed, mm-hmm. then it wasn't because Sarah was beautiful or anything like that. He was just worried about his own skin. Well, that was, I mean, Yes, I'm not taking away the fact, I still believe that she was beautiful because Abimelech wanted her and Abraham was caring, but still, Abraham's primary concern, going back to the agreement they made when they started this journey was, do me this favor, because he's concerned about, everybody's concerned in a sense about self-preservation, right? But Abraham is no doubt, um, his, his concern comes down to himself. And the, to me, the thought that self-preservation, as we look into the New Testament, is, don't worry about the the life here and now. Mm-hmm. You have to worry about the life that is to come. And, and uh, through these examples like this, and, and then the hardships that the, the early church suffered, and how they're encouraged to remain faithful even unto death, is to not get caught up in this. Just as an example. Right. And, and if Abraham had been killed, then he knew that she would be the you know, In other words, if he wasn't there, then was concerned about her because she doesn't know what would happen to her. And you kind of think, you know, I want to give Abraham, I don't want to you know, beat down on Lot too much. I don't want to beat down on Abraham because I wasn't in that situation. And it's easy in hindsight going, oh, you know, if I was there, just like, you know, the, the prophets or the the leaders in Jesus say, oh, if we'd have been there in the day of the Old Testament prophets, we wouldn't have tortured them. And Jesus goes, that's exactly what you would have done. <laughs> You're doing it now. You would have done that. So it's easy just for look back at Lot, look back at Abraham and say, I would have never done that. Yeah, you don't know. Hopefully not, but you just don't know until you're in that situation. But again, Abraham may have thought, I have the promise. And this promise has got to come about through me and Sarah's child. I've got to do whatever I can to protect that until that child is born. So maybe he was thinking that way and thought, if I get killed, then it's over. Or if they take Sarah and, and, and this other king takes her, then it's, it's over. So perhaps that's what he was thinking. Not so much a selfish motive. Maybe he was thinking in the, the bigger picture. I don't know. Maybe we'll get to ask him one day. But... <laughs> The whole Bible, every, every person that's mentioned in the Bible is supposed to be some sort of illustration of man and all across the board. And so, especially what we've been seeing with Lot and Abraham between chapter 19 and chapter 20 is the constant fall that man has of walking by sight, not walking by faith. And, uh, I mean, if we're honest, it's hard to walk it's by hard. faith. It's difficult. Uh, we can look at it and go, go, okay, Abraham should have known better, but we can only say that because we have the whole revelation of God, and that that in itself should be bolstering us to walk by faith. You right. see time and time again, men who are likely more righteous than us, uh, if you can even say that, um, falling to the same temptations. That we do. Right. Can you go back to that? I want to be easier on Abraham, especially because, like I said, how many of us called from our hometown in situations back then and said, hey, you need to leave and go do this? Would we ever got past the city limits? So Abraham has done a lot. He has done a lot. 
but he still, we still see some flaws. So again, I want to give a lot of grace, extend a lot of grace to, to Abraham in, in the life that he, he was living for God. Right, he, he didn't lie. He, he told the truth to his assistant, yeah. but he withheld information. Yeah. And the point was to deceive, though, right? So, yeah. It was, but to, to deceive, you know, he, he didn't, he withheld, he didn't. Yeah. I, I see what you're saying. But yeah. Yeah. I have people tell all the time with me who, who tell me partial truths. They're truths, and if you call them on, they'll tell you. I told you the truth of the intent. Right. To me, to, from from my from a biblical perspective, it goes, no, you lied to me. <laughs> I don't care what you, how you said and what the justification was. You lied to me. Right. I yeah. Like here, when he finds out his sin, what does he do the next day? He, he takes care of it. Does he do it like later in the day, later that week? No, he gets up early that morning. To me, Abimelech's a shining star of the story because, again, whenever you sometimes with ourselves, other people, you go and you correct them and say, Hey, this is wrong. What do you typically see the reaction? What is a typical reaction? Justification, denial, the dragging of the feet. Maybe they'll get around to correcting it here eventually. That's typically what you see. What does Abimelech do? First thing in the morning, he gets up. Who does he tell first? His people. He tells them, this is what's going on. What is their reaction? Oh, my goodness. So, again, Abraham's perception of the place being a godless place, a non-God-fearing place, he was way off base. And it comes back to the leadership, right? So he's leading it, and he's leading a, a, a good area. They're trying to do what's right. And he goes to Abraham, and he goes to Abraham, and he doesn't just restore him and, and send her away. He has a discussion with him. He goes, like, basically, why would you do this to me? Why would you uh, treat me so poorly to, to get me in the situation where I'm in trouble? Uh, you think about the song, um, you never mentioned him to me. And you think about that. And, um, I mean, we're going to face judgment, right? But we're going to face judgment with people we recognize and people that recognize us. Can you imagine what some of our friends and relatives are going to say to us if given that chance? Or the looks they're going to give us when we're all standing for God? They're going to say, like, what did I ever do to you to make you hate me so much? that you didn't tell me about what you knew about God. You think about why we say we don't do it here. We don't do it here because we don't want to hurt their feelings. We know we're going to upset them. All those things we use, which are true. But again, when it's all said and done and reality is laid bare in the face and we're face to face with God, what is their reaction going to be? No. Why did you hate me? Why did you go out of your way? To try to um, to try to fix it. Which would have been like he gives Abraham a piece of land. Says what silver and gold or something. Mm -hmm. Because we told his told Sarah his wife said, he gave your brother a thousand pieces of silver or something like that. Right, we haven't read that yet, but yeah, he's gonna almost like a dowry, he's gonna pay for her anyway. And that happened with Abraham and his situation, right? Or um, even with the Egyptians, right? Whenever they figure out the wrong situation, they try to correct it. Um, to try to cover that sin, to appease for that sin. Yeah, could he do it ever? Take uh, partial land, where would you desire? Could he take yeah. yours? Right. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and read through, um, let's go to the end of the chapter. 13 through the end. Pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. 
In every place whither we shall come, say, unto me, say of me, He is my brother. And then the Lord took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them to Abraham and restored Sarah, him to Sarah, his wife. And then the Lord said, Behold, my land is before thee, dwell where it pleases thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of thine eyes unto all that thou art with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wounds of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Okay, so there's an explanation where Abraham not only explains what he did in this instance, but from the very beginning of their wanderings, where he says, anywhere we go, Sarah, do me this kindness. Say you're my sister. And so again, I can't help but think, again, I don't want to again paint, paint Abraham in a bad light, but it does remind me a little bit about Ananias and Sapphira, right, in the New Testament, where they had talked about this. This was the deception they were going to do everywhere they traveled to. So again, um, again, I don't want to come down hard on Abraham, but this is something that they had talked about. Um, Abimelech, in a sense, almost like he pays a dowry to Abraham as if he was going to take her for his wife. He gives her, gives him, she, men service, maid service, silver. He gives us all this stuff. Again, it's similar to what the Egyptians did, right? Whenever Abraham and Sarah were in the same situation there, that they paid Abraham and gave her back again because God intervened in that same situation. Um, what's interesting what do you find interesting in verse 16 because what we're reading about now is, is Abimelech's dealing with Abraham but what does Abimelech take it one step further who does he talk to in verse 16 he goes to Sarah herself right and what does the last part of 16 say reproved her what do you do when you reprove somebody what does that mean reproving yeah yeah, you're correcting somebody. You're saying, again, because Abraham's revealed that this is their pact when they go places. Abimelech gives this stuff to them, and then he talks to Sarah and basically says, this isn't what you should be doing. This isn't the right way to handle this. Here, we're going to make all this right, but again, you shouldn't be doing this. What about the eyes? Say it again. In the next verse, it's about the eyes. The about eyes, the, the eyes. Oh, the covering for the uh, covering of the eyes. You mean in sixteen? Yeah, I'm not sure, but the, actually, that figure of speech, a covering of the eyes. The ESV says it's a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. Oh, okay. It, it's it's it's, it's, it's uh, maybe to the idea of perception that this situation is being made right. It's not like um, it's not like you remember when um, going New Testament. This is the off the tough, off the cuff, so I'm probably wrong. You remember when Joseph found out that Mary was with a child, New Testament, you remember that? Yeah. What was he going to do with her privately? Her he was going to put her away, not to create, try not to make a big deal about it, right? But still, if you put her away, they knew that she was betrothed, so that people would eventually say, like, you can't put her away privately, right? So maybe here, this covering for the eyes is people had seen a like take her in to his wife, and now she's going back to her so-called brother, to Abraham. But this money and this exchanging of, of gifts is to say that this is all above board. And maybe Abimelech, I can't imagine, since he's already talked with his servant, saying that this is an innocency I've done this. God told me what it, the situation was, and I'm correcting it. Again, is to make it all um, above board, for lack of a better expression, right? To make it where it's not something that's done in secret. Because if you're going to correct something, if there's somebody, if, like a, if there's a, a, a sinful situation that's going on. How does the Bible tell us to address a sinful situation when we're trying to correct it? What are the steps? You go to the person by yourself, right? You try to handle it that way. If that person won't hear it, what do you do next? You go tell everybody else behind their back. What, no, no. You take two or three people and you go talk to them and try to fix it, right? If they refuse that, then what do you do? Take it to the church. Those are the steps that you that you use to correct it. So again, here it was a bad situation. Abimelech could have just dismissed it off to the side, but the fact is, the fact that he had taken her again to as a wife, it was a it was a public knowledge type of thing. 
So I believe, again, this, again, the covering for eyes, this is a guess, this is from a little bit I've heard, is just, again, making it where it's not a, a, a shame for her. This is just being handled appropriately. Um, I, I, I agree. Um, because of the first part of 16, of, um, he's given Abraham all of his things. And evidently, he's done it open because, you know, uh, AS to be not to mind says, it, it is for thee a covering of the eyes. It is uh, an appearance. And then, because it says, to all that are with thee and with all the others. So everybody would be able to see that it had, there had been like repentance done about yeah. this right. Yeah. And that it, it wouldn't be uh, a shame for her to use. The ESV, instead of uh, reproof, it said vindicated. Okay. And the, the Hebrew words, I just looked it up, lends itself to both explanations. And really, you see both words actually do come together between vindication and reproof. A lot of times people just think of vindication as like um, the, the guilt is gone, but it takes place after the guilt has been exposed. Okay, yeah, that's fair. I like that. I mean, that makes sense. Anything else on that? Chris, the, the commentary you have on my iPad here says, again, this is some instance box. Right. Something else to be considered. Uh, where it's talking about a covering of the eyes, the, the note here says, a protection of her person and chastity. So a husband in our language is said to be a cover to his wife and she under a cover. Thus Abraham now being known to be the husband of Sarah would for the future be a covering to her that no one should look upon her and desire her and take her to be his wife. Yeah. I can see where that makes sense too. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say um, kind of thinking about uh, what Abraham had received now from Abimelech and also Pharaoh, uh, it kind of, you know, they gave him stuff whenever in reality he should have been giving them stuff. And so right here it kind of presents itself as a, kind of like the New Testament principle, Romans 12, verse 20, to heap hot coals of fire upon their head. And you do that how? Through your generosity to the person who's wrong. So that seems to me, at least in, the, in a degree, what Abimelech is doing. Now, Abimelech could be just offering this out of an abundance of caution towards uh, wronging one of God's prophets, as God called Abraham. But it could also be this idea, because he does say he reproved, he justified, he vindicated Sarah. So it could be this idea that he's just reaping high coals. Possible, yeah. Yeah, because he, he uh, it's not only has he repented, because the first thing that morning he's taken care of it, but he's also, there's this outward sign that everybody else can see as well. Is that, yeah. Going above and beyond, yeah. leaving no doubt. And then the last um, few verses there again, apparently, again, since it, you, we talked about being a sin, we talked about being an unknown sin, but there still was punishment, right? What was the punishment they were experiencing? They've been looking at his people. Couldn't have, any kids. Couldn't have any kids, and kids were everything back then. Kids were that we can't, we don't comprehend how important children were to people back then. They were everything, and God had stopped that. I was saying, timing wise, for that to even be known and seen or, or everything, there else. was some time here, even though this reads pretty quick. For that to be made aware of, it had to be several months that this was going on, um, before it became evident that this was a problem. Um, so again. Abraham, and then after all this justification, after all this made known, after it's corrected, Abraham, in the office as a prophet of God, prays for Abimelech and his people, and that punishment for the sin is taken away. I kind of think about that, uh, the idea that it could be several months or whatever. If you think about it in that, that's been a lapse of time. Abimelech is well acquainted with Sarah. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, you know, he hasn't had a child with her, but he knows her. There, I would imagine, some sort of bond, some sort of emotional bond or something there. But yet, whenever Abimelech realizes this is another man's wife, he immediately puts her away. And it just kind of demonstrates the attitude of repentance that should be found in 
case of if you marry someone who is not uh, right to be remarried or something like that. But I mean, really, it, it kind of just intensifies the responsibility that we have to repent of all sins. But I think mostly about that, because a lot of people back out of that repentance because of the emotional harm. Right. Right. True. <coughs> Well, we're out of time, so next week we'll do chapter 21. Thank you all.